screen. All right, so hey everyone, welcome to CrikeyCon Day 2. Hey! Uh, so, if you notice, they've set up the escape room outside on the lawn. That uh, opens at 10. You can lock yourself in, get out by solving puzzles. I think it's a flag for the capture, uh, capture the flag as well, so if you want to go and do that, you can. I'm going to introduce the first talk, and this is by, as <laughs> I think it was Wade uh, said yesterday, he's only known by one name, like Beyonce, it's Silvio. <laughs> Dr. Silvio Cesare, an old friend of mine, uh, and he's going to be doing, you know, a real high-level non-technical talk. Uh, as he says, as he says in his abstract here, if you want to learn about the internals of the current Linux heap allocator, then, you know, this is the talk for you, right? Because that's, that's, that's a question you hear so often. I want to learn about the internals of the current Linux heap allocator. So, Dr. Silvio Cesare is the managing director at uh, InfoSec. They do training. And, you know, he's been an academic. He's been, he's been so many things to so many of us, Silvio. Uh, and this talk, you know, this is in the weed stuff. Uh, real in the weed stuff. I don't know if uh, some of you may have seen Silvio's live streams where he basically just uses Vim and Grep to find bugs, which is uh, pretty badass. Like, it, this guy doesn't even need syntax highlighting. And funnily enough, like, he was getting trolled recently on Twitter, and this was funny. And the guy, like, this guy who was trolling him is like, he's not even a real hacker. He uses Grep to find stuff. <laughs> I'm like, try it, dickhead. See how you go. Um, so anyway, uh, without further delay, here's the doctor. There is a doctor in the house. I'm going to just make him do, do that a couple more times. It's Silvio Cesare. Give it up for him. Uh, thank you very much. So this talk is about heap metadata corruption on modern Linux. Um, and effectively, I'm looking at uh, taking memory corruption bugs and other C programming bugs and turning them into useful um, exploit primitives um, on current glibc, uh, pt malloc2, and also a few other allocators as well. Um, so by the end of this talk, I hope everyone realizes that um, heap corruption is still an active area of research. There are still um, exploitation avenues available um, and uh, people can exploit things um, on current, current day systems, even with mitigation such as heap hardening and so forth. Um, Patrick has already uh, given me an introduction that I probably can't compete with, so I won't go into it too much. Uh, besides managing um, um, InfoSec and, and being the managing director there, I also co-organise uh, B-Sides Canberra with Kylie at the front, and we also do a C-Sides monthly meeting uh, back home in Canberra as well. Um, like Patrick said, I've, I've been an academic. I've worked in industry as well. I was actually the scanner architect at Qualys some years ago, uh, if you've used Qualys Guard in some of your vulnerability assessments. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to look at an introduction to OS memory management. Uh, so it's a very sort of um, quick introduction, just explaining you know, some of the basic things that you do to dynamically allocate memory in C. Uh, we'll look at heap allocator internals. Uh, specifically, we'll look at detail uh, in the PT malloc2 implementation, which is the allocator for glibc. I uh, will also look quickly at JE malloc, which is the FreeBSD allocator, um, but we won't go into that too much. Uh, we'll go into heap exploitation, where we'll look at uh, attacks at work today on current glibc uh, implementations and some of the other allocators that are out there as well, such as JE malloc, um, TC malloc. Um, and so forth. We'll also look at quickly um, partition alloc, which is the hardened Chrome um, allocator uh, in the renderer. Uh, finally, we'll end up with heap um, exploit mitigations and general exploit mitigations uh, and sort of conclude the presentation. So a quick introduction to OS memory management. Uh, uh, effectively, we're working with virtual memory. So not working directly with physical memory, we're looking at pages, working with virtual memory. Uh, and that's from a user space uh, view of a, of a process. Uh, virtual memory is a linear or contiguous address space, so it gives a very uniform view of memory for processes that exist. Uh, if you're working directly with the kernel, you're not working with that linear address space, you're working with the uh, physical pages, and then there's uh, a translation that goes from that physical uh, memory into virtual memory uh, from a user land perspective. So all user land processes see virtual memory the same way. In a modern operating system, most operating systems really, 
Uh, a process has executable code, sometimes known as the text or text segment. Uh, it has a heap for dynamic memory management, typically includes a stack, uh, and that includes things like the environment, uh, sometimes local variables, procedure metadata, and so forth. Uh, within that address space, as well, the virtual memory address space, there's shared libraries as well. So when you run a program, it's almost certainly going to use, or well, almost certainly going to use libc and other shared libraries, and that's mapped into the address space as well. And due to the magic of things like copy on write, um, you don't need to make physical copies of that, that back-end memory. The, the, the OS kernel handles that transparently, so you, can, you, know, you don't necessarily need um, all that virtual memory address space allocated in physical memory. There's a user space um, API to handle dynamic memory management. So a lot of you are probably, probably familiar with the C API, such as malloc and free. Uh, there's also variations of that, that API with calloc, which zeroes out memory as well, or realloc, which uh, reallocates memory. Uh, in C++, you have new and delete, uh, which is very similar to, to, to malloc and free, effectively. Uh, if you go into kernel space, you have uh, a different set of APIs. Uh, and in Linux, you would have things like kmalloc and kzalloc and so forth. Uh, somewhat similar to the, the user space API, but operating in the kernel specifically. And BSD and, and other OSs have their own APIs as well. So this is a sort of a trivial, sort of contrived example of, of, of memory management or dynamic memory allocation in a sort of a very simple C program. It's not really a, a useful C program by, by any stretch of the imagination, but it simply allocates uh, 20 bytes of memory and copies a string um, into that, um, th that buffer that it allocates. <coughs> it then frees that memory and then exits from the program. So we can see a simple example of allocating memory using that, that buffer that's been allocated and then deallocating that memory or releasing that resource. So the user space allocator um, operates on, on sort of smaller uh, runs or, 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 or parts of memory. Um, in the back end, when you start working with the OS and the kernel directly, uh, you want to make requests. So the user space allocator subdivides larger regions of memory that it allocates from that back end allocation, which uses the kernel. And to do that, it uses things like, um, um, you know, allocates pages at a time using mmap and, and break and so forth. So like I said, to allocate though that, you know, those, those bigger regions of memory so that the, the, the user land allocator can subdivide it up into little regions, it uses that backend mmap system call. Um, and sometimes, sort of historically now, uh, it uses the break or sbreak. Uh, system call, which just extends the data segment. But typically, most allocators today use the MMAP um, system call. <coughs> when you're working with the kernel, uh, you typically allocate in page size chunks at a time. So the kernel allocator internally uses page size allocations. When we look at heap allocator implementations that are out there, in user space, we have things like JE malloc, and that's used in the BSD family of operating systems. It's used in Firefox as well internally, and it's also used for Android. So quite an important allocator when you're working on those targets. Um, TC malloc is an is a allocator created by Google, and historically it was used for WebKit. Um, and PT malloc too is, is the one we're really sort of uh, got special interest today, and that's the Linux glibc allocator. We'll also talk about partition alloc, which is, again, I said, is the Chrome um, hardened allocator uh, in the renderer. Uh, when you look at kernel implementations of heap allocators, BSD has its own version, uh, and Linux has the, the slub and slob and um, uh, allocators as well. So given that introduction, it's just sort of we've talked about you know, what a heap allocator generally does. It takes a sort of a large region of memory and subdivides it into little sections and, and allocates that to user land, well, user land processes that request uh, sizes of memory. Uh, we also talked about different allocators that are out there, from JE malloc to Android and TC malloc and partition alloc and so forth. Now we'll talk about the internals of one, of one or two particular allocators, um, PT malloc 2 which is the allocator used in glibc. And we'll also talk about JE malloc just very briefly. Uh, PT malloc 2 uh, works primarily on malloc chunks. This is sort of the, the focal point of all what the allocator does. And, it, you know, and these malloc chunks are used for both allocated memory and free memory as well. So you know, in our contiguous address space, there are a bunch of chunks, free allocated memory, 
and between these, or at the end, and at the end and at the beginning of these chunks, are, are, are metadata. Uh, and this metadata contains information about things like the size of the chunk and so forth, whether it's free and so forth. And this is really one of the fatal flaws, I think, for PTMLOC2 is that use of inline metadata, which makes metadata corruption um, still possible today. If you look at other allocators like JEMLOC, um, they've gone a different approach um, and tried to avoid putting metadata in between um, chunks of equally sized memory. So in this particular example, we've got two chunks. We've got an in-use or allocated chunk of memory, and we've got a free chunk. And in this in-use chunk of memory, there is a size field um, preceding this malloc chunk. So that's basically the metadata that we have. Uh, when we have a free chunk, we have our, our chunk of memory. Uh, and before that sort of chunk, we have a size field again. Uh, and at the end of that chunk, we also have that size field again. Uh, within that chunk, you know, it's, it's not allocated memory, it's free memory, so the allocator is sort of can use it for other types of stuff. It generally contains um, pointers uh, that maintain it in a concept of almost like a free list of, of, of free chunks. So almost like a linked list of free chunks. And this is quite interesting because now we, you know, if we have a free chunk of memory and it's part of a linked list, well, maybe we can modify some of those pointers and, and make the allocator do something that it's not meant to do. So that's sort of, if we have a use after free, for example, you know, we might have access to those pointers. We can corrupt it, you know, in, in an ideal case, we'll just get um, some sort of integrity check value from the allocator to say, well, you know, this is a, you know, a, a corrupt chunk. But if we can maintain those integrity checks, we might be able to get the allocator to do something that it's not meant to do. Now, chunks are sort of the very low level of, of what memory is, is broken down into in the process. But there's a sort of a higher concept of this concept of arenas or heaps. And arenas are effectively um, grouping all these chunks together in a particular sort of heap itself or, or multiple heaps so that there's less thread contention between threads that are competing for use of the allocator. So arenas are primarily to reduce thread contention. They sort of give separate heaps for different threads associated with them. And this is what a sort of a heap in an arena looks like. We won't get into it too much. Uh, we, we won't really look at um, attacks directly on arenas here. A very um, important concept in PT malloc is the concept of bins. And bins uh, are associated with free chunks of memory. And bins basically um, collect these free chunks of memory in a linked list. And there are different bins for different sizes of memory um, or different um, uses of that memory. So bins come in different sizes. There's an unsorted bin, there's a fast bin, a small bin, and a large bin. And these, remember, these bins are a collection of free lists. And these free lists are linked lists that hold our free chunks together. So this is sort of what, you know, we have an arena or a heap here, uh, and we have our, uh, our fast bins, which are stored as a singly linked list. Um, and then we have another set of bins that are stored in a doubly linked list here. So the top part is our singly linked list. Our bottom part is our doubly linked list. And we have singly linked lists for a, you know, a few types of bins, and we have doubly linked lists for other types of bins. Again, if, we, you know, if, we, if we're thinking what can we do with metadata corruption, you know, the pointers in these linked lists might be something useful. Um, and you know, may, maybe we can do something with them. Now, What's great to an attacker, but terrible for security, is a recent implementation in glibc, which is the thread cache, or the ptmalloc2 tcache. Uh, it's a recent introduction, and it improves performance significantly um, in threaded applications. And it effectively means that when an allocation occurs, it can look in this cache associated with the current thread and not contend uh, with the arena or some sort of shared pointer across threads, a shared, sh shared a locking object across threads. And it contains this a cache of free chunks for each thread. So it's sort of effectively uh, a list of bins associated with that thread that avoids all locking. And because it wants to be performant, it effectively doesn't do much integrity checking at all, which is great for an attacker. And it, in fact, makes heap metadata corruption much easier and reinvents a lot of the sort of historical um, attacks that existed as well. So this is what it look like, looks like internally. Um, again, it's you know, sort of like a concept of a free list. It effectively is a free list in a, in a bin of some kind. Uh, and it's just a forward, a singly linked list. Now, 
I'll sort of jump a little bit ahead and say, well, what happens if in our free list we corrupt one of those pointers? Maybe malloc at some later date will return an allocation to our corrupt pointer instead of an actual malloc chunk that, that physically exists. So we can get malloc effectively to return an arbitrary pointer if we make one of these pointers in our singly linked list point to somewhere that we want to do. And maybe if we make it point to a function pointer, <coughs> if we make our corrupt pointer point to a return address on the stack, we could get malloc you know, un un you know, unknown to the programmer to return a pointer to somewhere that it shouldn't. And if we can overwrite that because the attacker can control the data that goes into this buffer, then we can basically gain control flow execution. But that's jumping ahead. So. So in, if we use a um, GDB, uh, we can look at a, um, a tool in GDB. It's a plugin called Jeff. I don't know if you guys can read this. It's pretty small up here. Um, but it sort of shows information about the different types of, of bins. Um, it shows other information as well, but this is one particular way of showing uh, information about the bins that are in the process. And this is just running um, bin ls, setting a breakpoint at exit, and then just inspecting the heap to show me information about the, the bins that are available and what's in them. And in this particular case, we can see some of the entries in the tcache have entries in them. And it contains pointers to these chunks. Uh, we can see that there's nothing really in the fast bins. Uh, there's something in the unsorted bin. Uh, and we've got nothing in the small and large bins as well. So when you're an attacker, if you've got a buffer overflow at a particular point in time, you might say to yourself, well, what you know, bins or what chunks are available for me to corrupt? that I might get some useful primitive out of. So again, where is the metadata? Before and after each chunk, there is inline metadata. Um, unallocated buffers. The tcache free chunks are a really great source of <coughs> metadata that we can corrupt. And that tcache or thread cache is really a focal point for this presentation. And we'll look at some of the attacks we can do on that. If we corrupt one of those next pointers, then malloc can return that pointer because it thinks it's a free chunk, and we can get malloc to return another true pointer. So we'll quickly go through JE malloc as well. Uh, only one or two slides on this, so it's not, it's not that important for the talk, but it is good to see another type of allocator that is in contrast to PT malloc. Uh, JE malloc doesn't use inline metadata surrounding chunks, and in fact, it doesn't use the sort of, PT malloc likes to use the word malloc chunk quite you know, frequently. But JE malloc uses the word region to sort of represent the same thing. It's the buffer that's returned from an allocation. Um, and in JE malloc, these um, regions are grouped uh, uh, into, into runs, uh, where each region is the same size. And then there's different size runs uh, so that you can get a different size region when you do an allocation. So this is effectively uh, what we see when we have a, a JE malloc. Um, uh, in, in virtual memory. And these regions are grouped together within pages and runs. Uh, and there's you know, and, you know, what they call chunks surrounding that as well. But the important thing to note is that there's no inline metadata between those regions. And those regions are the thing that get returned by malloc. So JE malloc doesn't have inline metadata between regions. But it does have some metadata between runs. So we can potentially do some metadata corruption if we override past the length of a run and go into the next um, run header, I suppose. It also has arenas that are put into memory that we might be able to override as well, arena headers effectively. We won't really discuss JE malloc metadata corruption, um, but we will look at um, another type of attack uh, using double free exploitation with JE malloc, which it is vulnerable to. So we'll move into heap exploitation now. And we really need to understand, well, what types of things are we trying to exploit? What are the bugs that exist in C programs that lead to conditions that enable us to corrupt metadata or do things that we're not meant to do with the heap? So if you free a pointer that wasn't the result of a malloc, you can uh, do weird things with it. And that's, there's an attack known as the House of Spirit, uh, which we can do if we free a pointer that wasn't a result of Merrick, and we control where that pointer point, you know, control the target of a free and make it point to a fake header. If we access heap memory be beyond the size of the allocation or override it, we have a sort of a buffer overflow. If we, have, uh, if we free a pointer that was already deallocated, we have a double free. We can exploit that. 
And if we access memory that was deallocated but hasn't since been reallocated, we have a use after free and we can exploit that as well. So these are the types of bugs that we're looking for in C programs that enable us to do things that we're not meant to do with the allocator that might be useful to an attacker. So next couple of slides about uh, a precursor. This is sort of, you know, where did heap exploitation start and where, you know, where are we now? So if we go back in many, many years ago, almost 20 years ago now, um, we have DL malloc, Doug Lee's malloc, which was the precursor to the current PT malloc. Uh, it was sort of a fork and increased after that. So basically there was an attack from you know, 2001, I think, where you could overflow a crafted, you know, overflow a, a, a heap allocated buffer, you overwrite the metadata, and when that buffer is freed, you, an attacker gains a write what where primitive. And a write what where primitive is basically saying that you can write what you want in memory, um, where you want it in memory, um, uh, and, and then you've got a pretty good thing. And you can do things like modify function pointers so that your, your code, your attacker code, hijacks control flow. And this particular attack is known as the unlink attack, uh, developed by Solar Designer against Netscape Navigator. So this was in 2001. I've got a slide showing sort of his post from 2001. Uh, so sort of there's, there's some great history when you look at exploitation. Um, Solar Designer was also the first, the author of the first heap exploit, generic heap exploit. He also developed the first non-executable stack patch for Linux um, and incidentally wrote the first attack against non-executable stacks known as return to libc, uh, which later developed into ROP, which we sort of know now. And he went on later to develop the open wall secure Linux distribution. So all through the first heap exploit, first return to libc, also developed a secure Linux distro and wrote uh, significant patches. And this is, I don't think you can read this, but uh, this is from uh, the year 2000, sorry, not 2001, July 25, two, uh, year 2000, where he writes an exploit. This is sort of pre-browser exploitation, but wrote probably the first browser exploit as well, to be honest. And the way that this unlink attack works, where you get this write what where primitive, is that you're effectively, well, the allocator at the time was unlinking a node from a linked list. That's all it was doing. And by pointer manipulation, by unlinking this node, you were able to control the targets of the pointers that you were writing to and obtain this write what we are primitive. And you would use this primitive to overwrite a function pointer such as something in the global offset table uh, or some sort of you know, function pointer in memory. Uh, and that might begin a ROP chain, that might begin, you know, point to some sort of system, it might point to shell code and so forth. Now, Unlink has been dead as, a, as an attack for more than 15 years. So in 2004, they introduced um, um, heap mitigations. This was sort of the birth of hardening the heap on Linux at least. And Unlink now, well, at least for 15 years, checks that the pointers in the link, link, link list are node. The forward and backward pointers are quite reasonable and it looks like the list isn't corrupted. So it doesn't point, you know, so you can go forward and backwards and you arrive at the same point in the link list. And if you don't do that, it's probably corrupt and you're probably, um, there's some sort of metadata corruption going on. So you, you know, so this is, you know, this is well and truly dead. But this is what a lot of people sort of consider, you know, what heap exploitation is. You still might see this type of vulnerability being exploitable um, in badly designed custom heap allocators where they don't do these integrity checks, and you know, even in linked list implementations that have buffer overflows, you might have this type of attack as well, where you can get an arbitrary write what we're primitive. So that was in 2004 that they did those mitigations. So the year after. Uh, you know, we'll start to move into the post-unlink sort of heap exploitation era now. And in 2005, uh, we have a, a post uh, to bug tracks, which was a great security list at the time, a long time ago now, but Phantasmal, uh, Phantasmorgeria, I don't know how to pronounce that. He sort of posted uh, a set of, of attacks they're almost theoretical attacks against the glibc heap allocator. And a lot of people thought, you know, this is really quite amazing, but it's very, um, it's very futuristic in a sense. Uh, and th these attacks are sort of the birth of, of the post-unlink era of exploitation. And the types of attacks that you can do with this are very different than that traditional unlink exploit where you gain a right what we're primitive. So since then, there's, I mean, you can't read all of these links, but I've left it here in the slide deck so maybe people can look at it later. There's a bunch of attacks that have continued on with this work since you know, 2004, 2005, and we still see heap attacks are still possible today. 
using other types of attacks that aren't this traditional unlink, get a right what we're primitive. So modern heap metadata exploitation, at least since that era of post unlink, you're pretty unlikely to get a right what we're primitive um, today in most allocators. I mean, it's just, it's really, really quite unlikely. Instead, the goal generally is to make malloc return an arbitrary pointer decided by the attacker. You want malloc maybe to return a near arbitrary pointer, maybe somewhere on the stack. Maybe you want malloc to return an already allocated heap buffer. Or maybe you want malloc to return a buffer that overlaps another already heap allocated buffer. So these are the types of attacks you can do today on, on a lot of allocators, uh, including PT malloc too. Uh, so it's not that traditional right what where, but if you make malloc return an arbitrary pointer and your attacker controls what goes into that buffer, then you can basically uh, hijack control flow. Uh, and you know, again, if you control that buffer, then exploitation uh, is, is quite likely, at least without mitigations like control flow integrity. So just to go into that a little bit further, if malloc returns an arbitrary pointer that the attacker decides, make it point to a function pointer or a return address on the stack, uh, and then if the attacker controls that buffer, if they get to write eight bytes on 64 bits, they can hijack control flow. And that's effectively the, the idea of, of more modern heap exploitation. So sometimes, and that's effectively metadata corruption, I should probably should caveat that with that's modern um, heap metadata corruption. There are other approaches that don't attack metadata directly. So you don't, you don't always need to you know, make malloc return you know, an arbitrary pointer. If you allocate a desirable object adjacent to your chunk that has a buffer overflow, and that um, desired object that you made adjacent has a function pointer in it, you can just simply overflow from one chunk into the next chunk, uh, overwrite that function pointer, uh, and if it uses that function pointer later on, you gain control flow again. So that works on allocators that don't use inline metadata between objects, providing you have a useful object that you can allocate uh, adjacent uh, to that buffer overflow that you've got. And in fact, there's work on this, it even goes back you know, ten, 10 or so years, that you know, by carefully controlling allocations and deallocations in the application, and so if you have a browser, uh, it's much easier to control allocations and deallocations versus some sort of server-side software. Um, so you can groom the heap to meet your requirements of you know, putting chunks next to chunks that you want and so forth. Might not always be 100% reliable, depending on how your heap allocator works. Um, and it's harder with non-deterministic heaps as well. So if there's an element of randomness to the heaps where it's not allocating things in a, in a deterministic way, it makes it harder. But this goes back to heap feng shui, as it was called, uh, when it was written about 12 years ago. So now we're getting to actually um, some metadata corruption attacks that work today. Now this is uh, known as a house of spirit as it was originally called before the TCache changes were done. But the TCache changes enable the house of spirit attack to work quite easy. The idea is that if you control the pointer that's passed to free, and you control, and you make this pointer point to a fake header, then you can make, um, um, malloc um, uh, return into that fake header as well. So you want to create a fake header, chunk header on the stack. You want to have a fake size as part of your chunk header. That will put it in the correct tcash bin. And then a future malloc will now return that fake chunk back into the stack and you might allow to overwrite stack variables. Maybe you can overwrite return addresses on the stack and so forth. And all we're doing here effectively is we're making the pointer returned by malloc, that's under our control, that's what we're passing to free. We're putting in a fake size and then a future malloc, maybe two mallocs in front, will return a pointer to this fake header which is now on the stack or somewhere else that hasn't been um, you know, al you know, allocated by a malloc. Another thing that we might be able to do is if we consider our back to our, our, our picture of our, of, our, of our chunks and surrounding our chunks are, are inline metadata, including the size fields, if we have a buffer overflow in a chunk, we can overwrite past our buffer and overwrite into the size field. Now, when we free that chunk, 
it'll look at the size field, get it wrong, um, and put it back into a free list. And the next malloc now will allocate that chunk with the wrong size. And we can, in fact, make this size so large that it overlaps into an already allocated chunk of memory. So we're changing our, our chunk to a larger size, our size to a larger size. We're freeing it, puts it in the wrong free list. When we allocate it again, it returns our chunk with the wrong size that now overlaps into the chunk that was adjacent to it when we freed it. And that's sort of, that can be useful to an attacker. So how do we exploit something like that? Now, if one of those allocated objects holds a function pointer and overlaps the allocation that an attacker controls, the attacker can modify his chunk, which inadvertently modifies uh, the function pointer in the chunk that he's not meant to control, and then will be able to gain control flow execution. Now, there is another attack associated with this. Remember that our, our, our chunks have metadata with them as well. Um, overlapping uh, allocations expose inline heap metadata, uh, and we might be able to uh, read that from an attacker point of view and gain you know, memory disclosure, maybe gain information about free chunks and so forth and pointers. So all we're doing for an overlapping chunk is we're overflowing from one chunk into the next chunk and overriding the size field. That's all we're doing. And then when we free it, it goes into the wrong bin, we allocate it, comes back, now it's a much larger chunk that overlaps into that original adjacent chunk. This is probably, I, I think, the most useful attack out of the ones I've listed here. Consider if we have a heap layout, such as we have uh, an object or a malloc chunk that has a buffer overflow, and somewhere further in the virtual memory is a free chunk in the thread cache or the t-cache. Now, if we can overflow our buffer and overflow it so far that we write into the t-cache chunk and overwrite the next pointer in that chunk with an arbitrary pointer of our choosing, then a future malloc will return our arbitrary pointer. So all we're doing, remember, is our free list is a bunch of free chunks that, are, that, that can be used for mallocs later on. And if we overwrite one of these pointers in that singly linked list with our arbitrary pointer, such as pointing to a function pointer somewhere in the memory, we can get malloc to return that when it looks at that free cache, that, that, that t cache free chunk, uh, and then it will return our arbitrary pointer. So all we're doing is overflowing one field uh, in our tcache chunk, which is that next pointer. And this will be the target or the return value of a malloc when it uses that tcache free chunk. And you have to realize that uh, in the tcache, the, the bins are associated with the size. So you don't have to have the correct size in this, in this chunk. Because when it goes onto the free list, it goes into the correct bin associated with that size. So you can actually do this in GDB. Um, and if you have a sort of a, a generic uh, buffer overflow, you can simply put a cyclic pattern uh, into your buffer. Uh, and you can look at GDB when it crashes. And if you're in the tcache get function, then you just have to look at RDX, get your pattern that you got out of, your, out of that register, figure out the offset into that buffer, and you know the length or the, the, the buffer size that you need to do to overwrite that next field. And if you make that, you know, create a buffer with that size and then give your arbitrary pointer, you can turn this into a quite reasonable pr primitive. And this is a particular thing here. So in this particular case, we've got a, a crash in malloc. We calculated our offset from our pattern. It was 96 bytes. Uh, we created a buffer. Uh, the next, we created a buffer of 96 bytes and then we appended this address now, it's little endian um, x86. So um, the, the high bytes that are 0, um, you can assume that they're going to be 0 on, this, on, this, on, the, on, on the heap, perhaps. So you can actually use a string copy to do this attack. You can use a string copy to write your buffer, overwrite the pointer, and then get malloc to return an arbitrary pointer, such as somewhere on the stack or in a function pointer. So this is an example of this particular attack. 
in this particular case, we've done three allocations. We've malloced 16 bytes, 16 bytes, and 16 bytes. So A, B, and C, we've done those allocations. We've freed the third allocation. Now, from our first allocation, so when we freed that allocation, it went into the tcache free list, or the bin associated with that. So now this is on the heap. So now if we can overwrite that, that tcache chunk, we might be able to get malloc to return an arbitrary pointer. So we freed that, and now we overflow A with a string, and we can make malloc return an arbitrary pointer to somewhere that we control, in this particular case, on the stack. Maybe it points directly at a return address, and if an attacker now writes to that buffer, they can overwrite the return address and gain uh, hijacking of control flow. So that's sort of some of the metadata corruption attacks that I'm going to talk about. But I'm also going to talk about double-free attacks. And a double-free attack works that if a pointer has been allocated, and then it's been deallocated, um, and then it's deallocated again before it's you know, reallocated or reassigned a value. So double-free attacks classically are just free a pointer and then free a pointer again. Uh, most, well, some allocators will do simple checks for that particular use case. If you free something and immediately free it again, it'll you know, give a warning to say that it's, 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 you know, a double-free has occurred and, and it'll crash. Most allocators won't detect if you free a pointer, free something else, and then free that original pointer again. So most allocators won't detect that. You know, most allocators have a very simple logic of if the immediate thing that I freed is the same as the immediate thing that I freed just a second ago, then a double free has occurred. But it won't detect if you free something in between. Now, why is this useful to an attacker? Well, effectively, sort of the double freed pointer goes on a free list twice. And subsequent mallocs will return the same pointer twice. So you'll have P, in this particular case, return twice when, it, when, when a several allocations occur. That might lead to compromise when one of those buffers is attacker controlled uh, and the other contains a function pointer. Also to note is that this free chunk of memory, sort of free and allocated at the same time, it contains metadata. So if an attacker can read the buffer um, that's been allocated after this double free, they might be able to disclose um, um, pointers as well, which might lead to a compromise and defeat of ASLR. So in JE malloc, which is a BSD allocator, it's the allocator in Firefox as well, it does no detection of the very simple case of free a pointer and free a pointer again. So when we look at this particular, particular code, We've allocated 16 bytes of memory and assigned that to P. We freed it twice, which is the bug. That's the double free bug. And now if we do um, three allocations in a row after that, the first two allocations return the same pointer. So we've returned a pointer to an already allocated buffer from malloc. And that might lead to compromise. So if we look at it you know, running this program, the first malloc returns a pointer. We freed it twice. Now the next two mallocs return the same pointer, which is not good. So if one of those um, allocations, if we, if an attacker controls P1 or P2, and it has a function pointer, um, you know, one of them has a function pointer, we might be able to get an attack out of that. TC malloc is a Google malloc. It used to be in WebKit. Uh, there's no check at all for free a pointer and free a pointer again. So any. Um, in this particular case, any subsequent malloc will always return the same pointer after that double free bug occurs. It may lead to sort of corruption of the system if, if an attacker doesn't take that into account. But it returns the same buffer again and again, which might lead to compromise. Now, partition alloc is the hardened allocator for the Chrome renderer. Uh, and it has what, what, what what's they've put in sort of inline documentation as rudimentary double free protection. And there's a couple of different ways you can build partition alloc, whether it's in a release build or a debug build. Uh, a release build is sort of the normal one. Um, and in this particular case, we've allocated uh, uh, three objects. Um, and we've done that trick where we freed a pointer, freed something else, and freed the original pointer. And in this particular case, uh, when we do three mallocs after that, it returns our original pointer, returns something else, and then it returns our original pointer again. So we get that 
same pointer allocated twice um, by malloc. And this is in the hardened allocator. There, there's other reasons why this is hardened, the idea of isolated heaps and that, um, that, that, that objects that might lead to compromise if you have multiple in the same heap. Um, there, there, there are mitigations against generic types of attacks, but in terms of does the heap allocator not do what it's meant to do, and if you control the objects, can you do something? Absolutely. In a debug build, they go one step further. So they detect free pointer, free something else, free pointer. So you actually have to do free the pointer, free two other things, and then free the original pointer again. And that's in the, in the debug build. The debug build also has a static cookie, which is prepended and appended to the allocated buffer and gets zeroed out after freeing the memory. So if you actually wanted to exploit a debug build of partition alloc, you also need to be able to overwrite memory um, so you need sort of a use after free as well. Finally, PT malloc2, which is the glibc allocator for Linux, sort of, you know, default allocator for Linux. Um, the tcache changes introduced, um, removed effectively double free protection. So double free protection was detected for quite some time, but the tcache changes removed those protections. Um, but at the end of 2018, I think it was November 2018, um, they added some mitigations that were able to detect this. But before, sort of, you know, a few months ago, you could do free pointer and then free pointer again. These changes aren't currently in most of the distros, so this attack still works. So if, if we look at latest Ubuntu, for example, 18.04, it doesn't have these double free um, detection abilities that, that, are, that have since been put in. Now, use after freeze uh, are sort of an interesting thing altogether. Now, one thing that we might be able to do if we have a use uh, after free is if we can control what gets reallocated to our memory that we have a use after free, we might allocate an object that has a function pointer in it, and then we overwrite that function pointer with our use after free. And then when the, you know, the reallocated object uses that function pointer, we hijack control flow. So that's one use of a use after free. Now, another thing that we can do is that uh, if we have a use after free in PT malloc2, our free chunks contain a pointer in our tcache, and we can overwrite this so that we can make a future malloc return an arbitrary pointer. And that's one very simple. So if we are allowed to write eight bytes to a freed chunk of memory, we can get an arbitrary uh, return any pointer that you want by a future malloc in current glibc. Now this is sort of interesting. We can combine these approaches now. So if we have PT malloc2 and we need to overwrite um, our eight bytes, we can actually get a double free in PT malloc2, and our it's sort of, you know, is it allocated or is it unallocated? Because in fact, this, this memory that we get returned back from malloc also contains pointers in our tcache free list. So if we have a double free, we can overwrite one of these allocated buffers with our eight bytes, which makes a future malloc return an arbitrary pointer, and then we can get, um, you know, overriding a function pointer, uh, and so forth, and make it return an arbitrary pointer. So I suppose the question is, is this an exhaustive list of attacks? Absolutely not. There's, there's many more attacks um, still possible um, in current allocators. And in fact, I, I think it's certainly for PT malloc, it'll probably just continue going on, you know, year after year that people will, you know, there'll be mitigations, and there'll be more attacks against them, more mitigations and more attacks. So I think it's still a very important topic of research, um, and heap hardening has improved some things, but there's still a lot way, a, lo a long way to go. So I'll move into the, the mitigations now and, and go on to the conclusion. One of the problems with PT malloc um, is that it uses inline heap metadata, and it is actually very hard to secure when there's inline metadata that can be corrupted via heap overflow, via use after freeze, and so forth. More recently designed allocators tend to use what's known as bucket style allocators, so sort of like JE malloc where it assigns regions and it doesn't have inline metadata between them. And that actually does eliminate a large number of 
metadata corruption attacks. Another uh, mitigation, it's an older mitigation now, but I've just added it sort of for completion here, read-only relocations. So this is effectively a way of eliminating a bunch of useful function pointers that can be overwritten by an attacker in, in a running process. Uh, the, 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 the function point is that eliminates or, or remaps as read-only uh, in the global offset table, which are effectively addresses that are used by imports or shared library functions that are used by the program. And we just extend this idea to eliminate or minimize as many function pointers on the heap as possible anywhere in, in the process memory uh, so that an attacker can't overwrite one and gain control flow execution. Another mitigation that we can do is use non-deterministic heaps. Uh, make allocations less deterministic so we don't know what's going to be allocated um, adjacent to our buffers that we want to overflow and so forth. And that might make some approaches harder. That heap feng shui or heap grooming might be harder to do if the heap is more, or, or, or sorry, less deterministic. But things like PT malloc 2 are deterministic. So we can groom the heap providing we have a reasonable number of allocations and deallocations that we can control. Now, a more recent um, mitigation is the idea of isolated heaps. And this is effectively what partition alloc is sort of focusing on. So the idea is that to use different heaps for different types of object classes. And this avoids some classes of used after free bugs that can be exploited. So it tries to minimize the interactions between attacker-controlled objects and objects with function pointers and so forth. So that if you release an object on this isolated heap and you reallocate a new object that has a function pointer, it'll go to a different heap. And that's sort of one way of, of mitigating these types of used after free bugs. Might be still possible to exploit you. Maybe there's state that you can overwrite with similar size adjacent chunks and so forth, or maybe there's a useful chunk that hasn't been put on an isolated heap. But again, the bar is raised. And I think finally, I'm looking at control flow integrity. Control flow integrity tries to eliminate control flow hijacking outside of allowed execution paths. So the idea of that, if you override a function pointer, you can't just make it point to your ROP chain. It has to be part of the allowed control flow uh, that is declared by the program. Uh, also, uh, similar to that, are authenticated pointers or PAC um, on modern, modern ARM systems and iOS devices. These pointers add integrity bits to them um, so that you can check that the pointer hasn't been corrupted or rewritten by an attacker. And things like return addresses on the stack use these types of authenticated pointers in modern iOS devices. Now, will control flow integrity or authenticated pointers kill heap exploitation? I don't think so. I mean, there's certainly people online that, are, that have working exploits against um, the latest targets that have control flow integrity. So, you know, we, we certainly know it's, you know, we, it's possible. But it will, will, will make control flow hijacking harder. Uh, and there might be some attacks that only use data. So allowing not violating the control flow uh, that is declared by the program, but using data to modify the state of the program to elevate privileges instead. So in conclusion, heap exploitation is still a very active area of research. It's certainly not the case that heap hardening in the past 20 years has killed heap exploitation. All heap allocators still have weaknesses that do allow for exploitation. So thank you very much. Beautifully done. Done with two minutes to...